and and good. Jen, are you available? Can you give Sean Cottrell the capability of recording the meeting, please, and becoming a um, administrator? Testing one, two, three. Yep, uh, this is Sean Cottrell. The ACL meeting room is currently muted in case anyone is talking who's physically uh, at the clubhouse. Thanks. Yeah, if we could get every, everybody that's actually on a Zoom meeting um, to mute their, uh, their Zoom sessions, that would be great. Um, that way only, um, only the administrators are, can be, will be speaking and communicating with everyone. There is an 815-492-2565, they, thank you. Sean, are you able to uh, start recording the meeting too? Uh, yes, I've already started recording. Thank you. Thanks. Give everybody another minute or so. Um, let's see. Are we all present? Uh, is uh, Jen uh, available? Is she in the room or? Um... Hi, Val, I'm here. Okay, can we uh, go ahead and start the meeting? Sure. Okay, I'd like to first welcome everybody to the town hall sure. meeting. Um, to discuss the zebra mussel problem that we have currently at the lake. Uh, I've invited both Dr. David Hammond and uh, uh, Dr. John Sonnenberg, uh, both to be part of this meeting. Uh, just so we go through a couple of particulars and how we're gonna run the meeting, what we're gonna do is there's gonna be the first section. During the first section of the meeting, uh, the uh, questions will be presented to both uh, David Hammond and John Sonnenberg, and they can uh, answer, answer those particular questions. Um, the board can jump in if they would like to get any clarification on those answers. If not, uh, we will move on to uh, other questions. We will hold off on um, getting any questions um, on these particular items until later on. Now, the people that are on a chat can place, or rather on the Zoom meeting, can place any questions into chat sessions. Those chat sessions will be read later after all the original questions are asked. All right. Then finally, after those uh, chat session questions are asked, uh, the people that are currently at the town in the clubhouse can get uh, ask their particular questions and get clarification. And we'll work until all questions are finally uh, completed, all right? So with that, what I'd like to do is introduce to everybody that is not familiar with um, Dr. David Hammond. He lives in California. He is by far one of the senior scientists at Earth Science uh, Laboratories. He is part of, of the company that manufactures Earth Tech. Um, it is a highly efficient product that actually uh, deals with bacteria and, and algae blooms, as well as evasive species like uh, zebra mussels. Uh, he's a consultant across the United States involved with um, 
of solving problems related to drinking water, water supply, and energy generation and efficiency. Uh, Dr. David Hammond has been uh, working and consulting with us uh, for a little over a year now on the zebra bond muscle issue. Welcome, David. Okay. Um, John, are you uh, currently, um, I see you. Okay, great. Also, we have joining us today is Dr. Uh, John Sonnenberg. Dr. John Sonnenberg lives in Illinois on Highland Lake uh, and in uh, Highland Park, Illinois. Um, he is a homeowner on uh, that lake, which is uh, currently has zebra mussels. He's been working with uh, zebra mussels for many, many years. He's uh, an expert. He has a accredited college course that students from Northwestern, Loyola, Purdue, go through his uh, summer course and participate in evasive uh, sciences. And they get their hands on with all the evasive species that go on through um, uh, Lake, uh, Lake Park, Illinois. Um, anyway, welcome John uh, for Hi. attending today as well as uh, David. So uh, what we're going to do, just so everybody is aware, uh, again, uh, what we're going to do is the first section, then we're going to read and only the board members will participate uh, if they have clarification. Other than that, we will move on with those questions to the, to the online chat people that are via Zoom and then finally to the people that are physically at this meeting. So what I'm going to do is start reading the questions and David and John then can participate in the answers. The first question. Will, it's a two-part. Hey, yes. Oh, you want to talk? Yeah, go ahead, David. If you want to go ahead and give um, a discussion first, yes, go right ahead. Uh, Dr. Hammond, you're currently muted. How do I unmute myself? There you go. Oh, you just were, but uh, hang on. Sorry, one moment. Okay, go ahead and uh, try again. There you go. We should be able yeah, to hear great. you. Um, Perfect. Yeah, I guess uh, you can press the space bar to temporarily unmute yourself, but it, it doesn't stick. Um, yeah, so we can just dive right into the questions if you want, but we had talked about maybe doing a five or 10 minute kind of intro, which I did put together. I have a PowerPoint um, slide deck that just would give people some background. So if you would like to do that, I'm prepared yeah. to do it. Go ahead. Please. Okay. Uh, I, you need to allow me to share my screen. Uh, Jen, that might be something you have to do. I'm unable to uh, set Dr. Hammond to share. Yeah, I'm not able to do that either. <laughs> there we go. There you go. Okay. Okay. So um, this is uh, borrowing slides from various other presentations. I just cobbled together something that I uh, felt is better customized to Apple Canyon Lake um, and just gives you a background on the product, which is called EarthTech QZ. Now it started as EarthTech, which is an algicide and bactericide. And EarthTech has been around for about 30 years and it's registered in all 50 states. Um, and uh, it was in the course of using it as an algicide that we stumbled across the realization that it works also for zebra and quagga mussels. Hence the um, addition of a, a, another label, uh, EarthTech QZ standing for quagga zebra. And what's different about EarthTech and EarthTech QZ as compared to other copper products of which there are many, uh, you know, dozens or maybe even hundreds of copper uh, pesticides are out there. What's different about ours is the way we formulate the copper. Um, our base formulation is a, an acid, um, a proprietary acid that's um, actually unique. We have a, now a composition of matter patent 
which is the strongest type of patent that you can get. It's saying that this is a new molecule. Um, and uh, what it does is it keeps the copper in the cupric ion form, which makes it very bioavailable. And uh, that's why I've put this subtitle of a more rational use of copper. Copper has been used very heavily historically and it's led to kind of a backlash against copper in some places because it was just, you know, so heavily relied upon. Uh, some places they don't, you know, they've just said, we don't want to use copper anymore, period. But I think that's a rash approach um, because it's probably the oldest uh, pesticidal agent known to humanity. It's been used for thousands of years. People used to store water in copper urns and pick up the antimicrobial properties of the copper to keep their water from you know, going bad. Um, so what's nice about this is it uh, makes it a more surgical tool um, uh, and uh, what I would call a green chemistry because you don't have to use as much in order to get the desired um, results. Um, and I was recently honored to be co-author of a book about green chemistry with Paul Anastas, who is widely regarded as the father of green chemistry. And uh, while the book had a different topic, it was more about preventing terrorist attacks and accidents um, from toxic chemicals. Uh, uh, I, I felt it's uh, relevant to mention just because, again, I think EarthTech and EarthTech QZ are both good examples of a green chemistry in which you don't have to use as much. Uh, just a little there on my background, I have a master's degree from UC Berkeley in the Energy and Resources Group, which is kind of an environmental science broad uh, interdisciplinary program, and a PhD also from UC Berkeley in agricultural and environmental chemistry. I worked with algae since those days in grad school. I also was the founder of a nonprofit organization in Guatemala teaching sustainable agriculture to small farmers there. I've got numerous patents and publications. Um, and I uh, mentioned those just to uh, help convey that really I'm an environmentalist, and uh, but I, I do have a background in pest management. And uh, so uh, what I've been looking for are the least toxic methods to achieve pest control. And um, frankly, chemical control is generally should be your last resort. You should try everything else first. But um, sometimes you get down to your last resort and you need to use a chemical. Uh, and in that case, hopefully you can use a green chemistry that is uh, relatively benign um, to the environment. Uh, EarthTech is also used in a variety of other markets in agriculture. It's applied to crops under another brand name called Agritech. Um, so there's hundreds of farmers who use this product uh, in their drip irrigation systems to keep the drip irrigation lines free from algae and bacteria that clog the drip uh, emitters. Um, it's OMRI listed uh, as organic, uh, believe it or not, uh, in California. Um, it's also, uh, oops, well, I had a... Sorry, I've had another slide here about uh, the fact that it's used in swimming pools. Um, uh, there, so there's thousands of people who are applying this exact same chemistry just under a different brand name. Sorry, I, I guess I deleted the slide inadvertently, but it's called Pristine Blue is the uh, name of the product in the pool market, um, exact same chemistry. And uh, thousands of people are applying this product into their swimming pools and uh, getting right in and swimming and potentially you know, swallowing the water uh, treated with uh, earth tech. Um, uh, and incidentally, that's at quite a bit higher dose than we would um, propose using in Apple Canyon Lake. Um, so it's safe for food crops, it's safe for swimming. Um, it's also uh, NSF certified for use in drinking water and uh, drinking water treatment plants use it for algae uh, control right in the in the plant. Um, this is some data to support my statement that it is a green chemistry. Uh, if you look at the uh, blue line, that's uh, conventional copper sulfate pentahydrate, and the red line is EarthTech. 
And what this graph is, is an algal inhibition test, and it's run by a third-party lab, an impartial lab in California called Aquatic Bioassay and Consulting. And this algal inhibition test is their way of measuring how much copper, in this case, do you need to add in order to inhibit the algae? And what you see is that if you pick one concentration, like 25% inhibition of the algae, then you see that you need to add three times as much, 0.36 as copper sulfate pinohydrate versus 0.12 as earth tech. So three times as much copper uh, uh, when added as copper, sulf uh, copper sulfate pinohydrate in order to achieve comparable algal control. So that's data illustrating my statement of it's being a green chemistry and you don't have to use as much. Uh, we see this, the same thing with users uh, in the field. That last slide was in a lab in beakers where um, you know, the, the copper sulfate can kind of compete better because it's a small system and very well mixed. But when we go out to a lake frequently, that threefold difference becomes more like a five-fold difference or sometimes even more. And that's what you see here. This is a water treatment plant in Ohio that historically used copper sulfate to control <laughs> algae in their reservoirs. And uh, the blue column shows the last year that they used copper sulfate. And the green column shows the first year that they switched to EarthTech ionic copper. And if you look at the amount of elemental copper applied, it went from 1,250 uh, pounds of elemental copper in 2012 uh, decreased by 80% to 240 pounds of elemental copper to achieve actually even better and longer lasting control uh, by switching to um, earth tech. And just switching the way you deliver the copper uh, can achieve these kinds of results. Um, just a quick example too, from another place in the field out uh, east in, in New York, uh, this lake in uh, West Nyack, had um, historically used 7,000 pounds of copper sulfate per treatment. And after switching to earth tech, in this case, they use uh, half as much um, copper. Um, the reason I'm touching on algae is because I know you have algae as well. And um, this is to uh, reiterate the point that it's safe. It's used in drinking water treatment plants, hundreds of municipal drinking water treatment plant utilities um, have or are applying EarthTech directly in their plants. Oh, here's the slide about the, the swimming pools. So the, the, that's pristine blue and the fact that thousands of homeowners are using the exact same chemistry in their swimming pools and spas. Uh, I'm gonna finish with a couple examples now directly on mussels. Uh, City of St. Paul in Minnesota is one of the first big users we had of EarthTech QZ. They started in 2016 um, for control of zebra mussels that they had in their pipeline and intake structure um, prior to the drinking water treatment plant, which was uh, four or which is four and a half miles away from the intake. This water comes from the Mississippi River and the intake building is this white building on the left. Of course, the intake is underwater, and so the water enters there and then goes four and a half miles to the water treatment plant. Well, inside the intake building, they have screens to keep out big things like branches and bags, um, but those screens are a very nice place for the muscles to attach, and um, they can turn a screen into essentially a wall in just a few months. And so these uh, workers at the plant, they couldn't be doing their other jobs because they were so busy just cleaning these screens by hand. And this is just one screen. They had dozens of screens in each intake. So it was very time consuming. And when they started using EarthTech QZ, it was basically problem solved. They just drip in a small concentration in the intake building and it protects, protects their screens uh, and the pipeline. I have a bunch more photos of that, but we don't have, I didn't want to take the time right now. Um, now jumping to a lake treatment, uh, that was a pipeline treatment, which is um, you know, uh, kind of the um, majority of our customers, I would say, are using the product to protect infrastructure like pipelines. But we do have a large group of customers who are also using it in open waters like lakes. And this is a publication in a peer reviewed journal 
uh, about a full lake eradication that we performed in uh, Pennsylvania in a former quarry uh, called Bill Meyer Quarry. And uh, this is just showing the mortality. We um, measured mortality using mussels in cages and placed those cages at different locations around the lake and also at different depths. And this is just comparing mortality uh, around the periphery of the lake uh, versus mortality in the center of the lake. And you can see that they were quite similar. Uh, you know, it took about 30 or 40 days to reach 100% mortality of the mussels in the cages. Uh, now jumping to another example, this one uh, in Illinois, uh, a full lake eradication at the Valley Low Club, which is a country club down in uh, north of Chicago uh, in Glenview. And there's 30 homes on uh, the east and south shores of the lake. And then on the north and west shores, it's the country club. Um, it's about 30 acres and um, relatively shallow, 15 feet. So this is um, quite easy to treat, um, but uh, sharing, you know, I, I, I know there were questions about what are the impacts of zebra mussels if we don't do anything? And this just shows you what they can do. This lake has native uh, mollusks, uh, unionids. These ones are called, the, uh, the common name is giant floaters. And the zebra mussels will attach to any solid surface, but they actually seem to prefer a um, live mollusk like a clam or a snail or a mussel, um, presumably because that organism is often filter feeding and it's, so it's sort of pulling water uh, to itself to feed. And that brings the zebra mussels also a constant stream of nutrients in the flowing water. That's why they like pipelines a lot is because there's water flowing through and that flowing water is bringing them nutrients and, and food. But it's a sad uh, situation that these zebra mussels will attach to and eventually just smother uh, native mollusks. And uh, someone did a study and found that when the cumulative weight of the zebra mussels uh, attached to the post um, mollusk um, it becomes equivalent when it, it's about the same weight of zebra mussels as it is the weight of the underlying um, native mussel, then the native mussel just can't, can't cope anymore with all that weight carrying it around and they just succumb. Um, and uh, in the five years after uh, zebra mussels were first discovered in the Great Lakes region, there were 12 species of native mollusk that were wiped out in this fashion by just being smothered by um, the invasive zebra mussels. So in Valley Low Lake, uh, we treated with 0.24 milligrams per liter as copper, that was 550 gallons. Uh, you can see the mussels were you know, kind of covering every solid surface around the perimeter of the lake. They don't uh, attach to soft sediment, but um, if there's rocks or chains or blocks or bricks, then that's what they'll like to attach to. Uh, these were the results from the treatment. You can see it was quite quick. Uh, we attribute that to the fact that the water was warm. Uh, things tend to speed up when temperatures are high. We can certainly control mussels in cold water, and we have. We've even uh, treated and successfully controlled mussels under the ice um, in, in the winter. But um, you know, when it's warm, uh, there's a certain advantage just that things seem to happen faster. So in this case, we had 100% mortality at the surface in just three days, and we got to 100% mortality at the lake bottom um, after 10 days. And uh, that was as measured by mussels in the cages. But of course, we looked around outside the cages and uh, looked everywhere to see if there was any live mussels. And you can see they're all just gaping, empty shells. We could not find a single live adult mussel. This shows the copper residual concentration from the day of treatment, which was July 26, when we treated with that uh, 0.24 milligrams per liter, which is the same as saying 240 parts per billion. 
Um, so we went from 240 parts per billion on July 26th, and it took about two and a half months for the copper to be completely consumed and be gone. And these other labels are from a, a presentation that I gave. We're not going to go into all the detail, but we were at 100% mortality of the cages by August 5th, just 10 days later. And um, we did measure some of the impacts on non-target organisms like zooplankton um, and fish. We didn't uh, see much impact on fish. Um, there was a short-lived impact on zooplankton, um, but it actually, by seven weeks after treatment, the zooplankton actually came roaring back to levels much higher than the zooplankton had been prior to treatment because the zebra mussels are so dominant, they really take over the system and keep most other species somewhat suppressed. When we treated with copper, yes, the zooplankton took a bit of a hit in the short term, but by removing the zebra mussels from the system, um, it allowed those zooplankton to rebound and uh, reach much higher levels. And we also measured diversity, uh, biodiversity uh, of the uh, organisms in the lake, which also increased following treatment. So yes, we're using a pesticide and any use of a pesticide always has trade-offs. The holy grail of a pesticide is one that only kills the target pest. You know, that's, that's the holy grail a pesticide that only kills one thing, the thing you don't want, but that's very rare. And um, so what we do is we do our best to kill as few other things as possible and, uh, and know that this is a short lived period. If we don't treat for the zebra mussels, we know they're gonna fundamentally alter the ecosystem and just take it over and have huge impacts on the lake. Um, but by kind of uh, uh, taking the step that, okay, we're gonna use a pesticide, it's gonna have an impact for a few weeks, but then you know, as a result of that treatment, we're gonna remove this goliath of the ecosystem, the zebra mussels that are invasive and taking over, we remove those and then the rest of the ecosystem can um, rebound and flourish and have uh, greater diversity than it would uh, under the um, invasive species um, dominance. Um, and then I left this slide in just because there were some questions about phosphorus that we can get to again on the questions, but um, this is just to illustrate you know, where the phosphorus is coming from. And most of it is from runoff and um, use of fertilizers, uh, both agricultural, agricultural and also home-based you know, people fertilizing their roses or their lawns, and it runs off into the lake. And the reason that this is important is because phosphorus tends to be the, the limiting nutrient for cyanobacteria or blue-green algae, which are the, the toxic algae that you hear about. And um, this uh, graphic um, illustrates what I mean by the limiting nutrient. Think of the water in this barrel as representing cyano, cyanobacterial growth. And the barrel can only fill as high as the lowest slat allows. And um, this is showing that phosphorus is the lowest slat. It's the limiting, it limits how much water can be in the barrel. So by analogy, it limits how much cyanobacterial growth there can be. Now, if you increase the phosphorus, you raise that slat higher and you allow greater growth of cyanobacteria. And that's what happens when you have runoff of phosphorus or addition of phosphorus one way or another into the lake. Another way uh, that it, it comes is from construction. R uh, construction sites have disruption of the soil and then you've got um, you know, uh, soil running into the lake and that introduces uh, nutrients, including phosphorus. So with that, I appreciate your patience. I, I know it might have taken a little bit longer than we uh, planned, but um, I thought it would be a good introduction uh, and give you guys some background uh, going into the questions. 
And then, and then, um, uh, could uh, this is John Sonberg? Uh, could I take up two minutes? I won't do what David just did, but yeah, go ahead. All right, hang on a second. I want to get back and share my screen if I can. Uh, let's see. Go. All right. You see my screen now? Yep. Yes, we do. All right. All right. So, um, first of all, I, I I'm my interest in this is I was a former science teacher, um, retired, and I do a lot of stuff in education still. And and uh, I, I literally meet with environmental science teachers all the time. Um, so it's one of these situations where my interest in this project is more scientific. I live on Highland Lake. Uh, you can see the image of the Highland Lake on your screen. My house is in the upper left corner up here where that the green little box is up here. Um, and it's a, uh, about a 110 acre lake. It's a kettle lake uh, created by a, a glacial um, calf that melted there at, you know, 10, 15,000 years ago. And uh, it's, it's actually near the town Round Lake. So if you're looking for it in a map, uh, it's our address is actually uh, Round Lake, Illinois. Um, Highland Lake, uh, my, my interest in this uh, peaked early because we were trying to prevent zebra mussels. Uh, we did a lot of education of uh, the, the community, try to keep the zebra mussels out of the lake. And um, our first um, identified uh, species was uh, identified on May 27, 2018. Within two years, we saw uh, complete saturation of the lake. And um, we had been literally monitoring the lake for, well, geez, now this will be our fourth year. And we, we and I'll talk a little bit about monitoring. We actually look at the biomass developed on uh, uh, some modified Hendy uh, uh, plates that uh, I'll show you an image of in a second. Uh, so we get all this data. Uh, we have, this is from 2020. Uh, in 2021, we started to monitoring the zooplankton and uh, the baby zebra mussels, the villagers. And we also treated for, uh, with her tech QZ. Um, at, at, and you can see the black line on this chart is really clear that when we started to treat the villagers, the babies were killed off. And the, the native populations, the orange and the blue lines uh, and the gray lines, those native species rebounded above the levels they were before to higher levels after the zebra mussel villagers were eliminated. So we started to attack the villagers and we use uh, what we call a shoreline treatment so we don't treat the whole lake. Uh, we just treat along the shorelines all the way around the lake, about 200 feet out is our treatment area. The, the first year when we treated, uh, we, uh, we used uh, basically uh, in, in terms of cost, we used about, uh, it was about $11,000 worth of cost of treatment uh, along the shoreline. And you can see in this picture of this boat that there's there's maybe it's a little bit muddy as we pulled the boat out, but, but there aren't populations of zebra mussels growing on it. Uh, there were very few on the edge, but that was it. Most of this is just surface. Um, so we did a really good job of not eliminating, but pretty much controlling the population. Uh, last year, 2022, uh, and again, this picture shows our interns. We have uh, funding from the state uh, for uh, interns. Last year, we had 23. Uh, next year, we've got funding for 72 interns. Uh, this is one of the handy dandy uh, plates that uh, we use to monitor uh, scientifically the population growth. Uh, and one of the interesting uh, factors was uh, we decided to try to determine what's the best concentration level. And what we did was we treated twice. And what happened was they, if after we treated, they would rebound, the villager populations would rebound. And um, what we realized was we have to keep that 
uh, constant. We have to do more. So we, we used uh, about $10,000, $15,000 range. I think it was you know, around 11,000. Uh, the first year we treated last year, we dropped it down to about five or six thousand dollars. Uh, and uh, what we're looking at now is uh, 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 this next summer, we're going to be treating uh, with about uh, seven to eight thousand dollars. And what we're hoping is that we can go back to seeing this kind of a, a drop off again of the villagers. When the villagers drop off, what we what we find is that we don't have the growth of the zebra mussels. So um, I'm not sure how well you can see these images, but what we're finding is that the 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 you can see some larger ones on here. I'll try to just blow this up a little bit. Can you guys see that picture? Yes. Okay. So you can see the larger zebra mussels, okay? So what happened last year was when we treated, um, we we did kill off some of the adult population. We did uh, eliminate some of the villagers and some of the babies, but we didn't treat enough. And what happened was they came back and you can see these juveniles now growing on the surface. Whereas the prior year, you wouldn't have seen the juveniles. You might've seen a few adults, but not many, but we would have just, we we're seeing this massive amount of juveniles. So what we're doing in our study is trying to determine the most efficacious process and procedure to try to control the zebra mussels. And that kind of, in our discussion today, you're going to hear uh, how we're approaching this. And the other approach is eradication. Um, again, I'm a, I'm a scientist. Uh, I don't have a stake in this thing. Um, I I just want the data. So I, I hope that one of the reasons I want to be involved with you guys, I hope you'll share the data with us about whatever way you guys go that you monitor your zebra mussels and we can uh, determine uh, you know how effective whatever treatment or non-treatment you guys decide uh, that we can see results from that and add it to our database. Right now we're studying, uh, this last year we studied four lakes in, Il in Lake County. We're going up to 10 to 12 lakes this next summer, and then we're going up to 30 lakes uh, in uh, 2024. And out of that data, we're hoping to develop uh, more scientific data about the best and most cost-effective way to, to, to treat uh, the muscles. And it's more about studying the environment, and our project is more about the education and using our interns to do that. So, so in our in our efforts, we're more concerned about these guys becoming uh, future environmental uh, warriors for us uh, than we are the effects on the zebra mussels. Although, uh, for me personally, since I live on the lake, uh, I do care about zebra mussels and and hope we can find a a, a way to uh, either eliminate or control them uh, so that we can have a, a better balance in our ecosystem. So that's where I'm coming from. And I just wanted to take a few seconds to explain that. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you, John. I appreciate that. But that said, let's jump into the questions. Uh, question we have is a two part question. Uh, hopefully, everybody can hear me. If not, let me know. Will the zebra mussels filter themselves to near ex extinction without applying any treatments? Will there be a reduction of zebra mussels after a period of time? Yeah, the answer, uh, go ahead. the answer to that is no, the zebra mussels will not filter themselves to near extinction. Um, with any invasive species, it's um, frequent, common to see that they go through kind of a boom bust cycle. And that's where their population um, eventually finds the, what we'd call the carrying capacity of the site. Uh, the, you know, it, it, the population dynamics figure out what that site can sustain. And so it, it goes too high, population gets too great, and, and it kind of collapses. And then it'll get big again and then collapse again and sort of find its medium. But they're not going to leave. <laughs> they're, and certainly not to extinction. Um, you may see, you know, in Eastern Europe, 
they exist, but they're not as invasive. They're, they have their relatively low level where they're native to, but um, uh, you know what we're seeing in the US, even at sites that have had them since the beginning, which means 40 years, almost 40 years, um, they're very dominant. Um, and uh, if there's any instance, you know, I, I heard comments previously that, oh, after seven years, they'll just go away. I don't know where that information came from that flies in the face of everything I've ever seen or heard or experienced. If that was uh, what happened in some place, you know, I'd be interested to hear about it just from an academic uh, perspective, but that is certainly not um, what generally happens. Yeah, and can I add a couple of things? One is uh, there's your lake is unique. Um, you know, it's an uh, anthropogenetic lake, meaning basically it was formed by a dam. Uh, you created that environment, and nature kind of took over naturally and and infested it with native species. Uh, the introduction of any invasive species into a native ecosystem uh, without predators uh, will will uh, aggressively take over that ecosystem. And so what's occurred throughout the Great Lakes and the lakes and streams around the Midwest and, and the East is the zebra mussels have dominated and taken over until, until a more dominant species came along, and that's quagga mussels. So what, what you're looking at is um, zebra mussels will be around until a more dominant aggressive species will take over. And uh, our, our efforts are, uh, again, partially education, partially con uh, control and, and manage. Um, but the education is, uh, please be aware that your, your, your ecosystem now has been invaded by a very aggressive species. And this thought that, you know, just you know, it'll die off. Uh, all that means is that it may have had a bad year because of the uh, water residency time or or the water flow or the nutrients available. But as soon as uh, it can come back, it will explode and overcome any native species and eliminate your, your native mussels. It'll affect your fish population. And then it does all this other side effect stuff of, of being a, a, a nuisance to the to the users of the lake. So uh, the, the only solution people had was throw up their hands and wait for quagga mussels to take over, which are even worse. Uh, until, um, you know, we, we're, we're seeing some research out there. And I think the, the product right now we're seeing the best data from is from this EarthTech QZ thing. I don't sell EarthTech QZ. Um, uh, that's Dr. Hammond's thing. But uh, I just want to make sure that you guys understand that um, they just don't go away. And I fully agree with what Dr. Ham just said. Okay, thank you. Now, I originally stated that uh, the board members, if they need, needed any clarification on this, they could do that at this time. The, the, does any board member want to ask anything specific that deals with this question? Okay, I guess not. Let's move on to the next question. Are, are you are you monitoring the chat? Are those questions coming in from the chat? Are we going to address those? Uh, yeah, that's going to happen uh, later on in, the, okay. in a, another uh, phase. Okay. okay, all right. Uh, in fact, what's happening is the 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 Zoom meeting uh, uh, people residents are actually entering their information into the chat facility. Okay. okay. All right. Next uh, question. Do high levels of phosphorus impact the zebra mussels directly or indirectly? Well, yeah, the short answer is no, not directly. Um, but, you know, I, I can't remember if maybe we come back to this later, but um, what happens with the phosphorus, as I said in uh, the introduction, is that it tends to lead to more cyanobacterial growth, which are the undesirable uh, species of algae. You know, you want algae. Your, your lake is not a swimming pool. It's an ecosystem. And it's a positive thing to have some algae. That's food for fish and other things that you want. So, um, but when you have increasing levels of phosphorus, it tends to make these cyanobacteria more likely to be present. And what's curious is that zebra mussels 
and quagga mussels, they're filter feeders, but they can selectively filter feed, meaning they'll swallow the tasty green algae and spit out the noxious, undesirable, or you know, bad tasting cyanobacteria. And so they have a selective pressure on the species of algae present. They're removing the um, desirable green algae and uh, by eating it and spitting it out, um, spitting out the um, undesirables, leaving them to be present and reproduce. So there are studies uh, and you know anecdotal observations just uh, showing that um, zebra mussels and quagga mussels tend to push your lake ecosystem towards more prevalence of cyanobacteria. So that's the um, interaction with phosphorus. And, and, um, and then uh, and to add to that is uh, keep in mind too that phosphorus is like the like that barrel worked for the algae and the uh, <laughs> it also works for zebra mussels. You put more phosphorus in the water. Uh, zebra mussels will pull the phosphorus from the water. Uh, they use it for their soft tissues and shells, uh, and uh, they will uh, continue to populate the lake, and they'll use up that phosphorus and taking it away from native plants and native species. Uh, so keep that in mind that it, there's this balance battle going on, and your zebra mussel now is your dominant factor in your lake. And that's that's critical because it's it is uh, making the, your cyanobacteria worse. It is making it harder for anything else to grow because it's taking that that food of life out of the water. Okay, thank you. Let's just move on to the next question then. What happens to our lake ecosystem if we do nothing? Well, I think we've kind of beaten this. <laughs> Of course, but you're getting the point. The zebra mussels will gradually take over as the dominant species in the lake. Um, they'll outcompete the other species uh, in terms of food, primarily algae. Um, so they outcompete other species and uh, physically smother um, many of them. So they have impacts on the zooplankton, on the fish, on other mollusks, on the uh, plant growth. Um, basically, they have affect everything else in the lake because they're so prolific and so dominant. If there were just a few of them, it wouldn't be a big deal. The problem is that there's so many. Now, one of the things that they do because they're filter feeders and they're very um, voracious, they filter a lot. Each little muscle can filter a liter per day which might not sound like a lot, but because there are billions or trillions or quadrillions of zebra mussels, I mean, we, they're, they're, it's common to see densities of 10,000 per square meter, even 50,000 per square meter. You know, you can look it up and find uh, many sites that have that kind of density. So there's just so many of them. When they're filtering, they're filtering the whole lake. In fact, there's, uh, uh, reports that the entire volume of Lake Erie can be filtered by zebra and quagga mussels now in 36 hours. That's incredible. Now, whether you believe it or not, you know, I don't know if it's 30, you know, we could say, oh, it's, that sounds, you know, um, uh, unbelievable. If it's not 36 hours, maybe it's, you know, three day, three days or six days or 36 days, you know, who cares? The point is, they're filtering a lot. And so they're taking all that algae out of the water. They make the water clearer. And, you know, some people will say, oh gosh, you know, the water's never been clearer. What's, what's so bad about these? I kind of like this. But the, uh, the other thing that happens is they take that algae out of the water and what do they do? They poop it out on the bottom. So they move the nutrients in the lake from the water column and deposit the nutrients on the bottom in their poop, which is called pseudofeces. And so they're fertilizing the bottom and now there's light penetration all the way to the bottom because the water's clearer. Whereas before you might've had a secchi depth 
of you know three feet or five feet, now all of a sudden the secchi depth is 25 feet and the light is getting to the bottom and where, the, uh, where it's fertilized and you get weeds growing. So again, very fundamental, profound changes on the ecosystem um, that can be hard to predict. We just, you know, uh, and I know you guys want to kind of the gist of the questions are, what's going to happen if we do this? What's going to happen if we do that? Well, it's hard to predict the future ever. You know, <laughs> there's always some doubt about or risk in, in predicting the future, but we can look at the trends and these are very established trends. So um, that's, that's my answer to this question. <laughs> yeah. And I, I agree with Dave. Okay. Go. All right, moving on. Um, the next question, can we maintain a healthy lake ecosystem without controlling the zebra mussel population? Kind of. Well, this is a, sub, a subjective question. You know, um, can, can we keep the lake healthy? What does healthy mean? You know, maybe there's some people who would say, yeah, they, you could, but in my opinion, no. Um, you know, you could, uh, you could try to eradicate them or you could um, take the approach of trying to suppress them and keep them to a, you know, very low level. Um, but, you know, personally, my preference is more towards eradication if it's feasible, um, just because I'd like to see them out and then the, the lake can get back to, you know, what it should be. Um, but, um, you know, if they, if they're in a lake for good, like they are in Lake Erie or very large lakes, you know, someday they'll probably reach a level that is, you know, not that harmful, just as in Eastern Europe where they came from. But that's, I would estimate hundreds of years down the line. They're gonna be a very damaging invasive species here for decades. So without controlling yeah. them, no, I don't think you can see a healthy lake. Okay. Yeah, and I, I, I just wanted to kind of comment on, um, uh, again, uh, whatever you guys do, uh, my interest in this is that uh, you, you make sure that you you analyze, you study, uh, you you look at it. Um, the the reality is your the the subjective term healthy uh, is uh, something you find in lake management terminology uh, and based on the utilization of that lake and what you know the 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 people who are in charge of lake management think should be done in that lake. And one of the problems with zebra mussels isn't just that they take over the ecosystem. Uh, they also cause a great deal of nuisance to, you know, irrigation systems, to uh, boating systems, to, uh, uh, you know, if you have, you know, swimming areas, uh, you know, we have a raft in the middle of our lake and, the, and the, the, to get back up on the lake, you have to climb up on ladders. Uh, and so they get saturated with zebra mussels. Uh, and, so for, for us, it's it's really about a um, uh, an, a concept of how do we scientifically study to find the best solution, and you know if you can eradicate uh, that truly is the the ultimate solution. Uh, but the there there's as David mentioned, there's this question, you know, if you can, and then how long can you? And for for us, it's uh, we want to study that. That's why we want to look at, you know, like 30 lakes. Uh, and we want to try to determine, you know, if you can, it is very problematic to try to control a invasive species. And um, it's one of these things, especially one that's so prolific. And I want to have you understand how prolific they are. Uh, we calculated in our 100 acre lake uh, on our, our, when we had the peak of the villagers, that there were 257 quadrillion villagers. 257 quadrillion villagers. That is a number that you can't even comprehend. Take trillions and put zeros behind it. And they're, they just overpopulate any area and saturate it. So if you can 
come up with an inexpensive way to, on a regular basis, control it. We you know, that's that's one of the steps. If you can't do that, then you try to eliminate it. And I think that's really the question of the day. If you sit back and you do nothing, uh, you basically have a bathtub, and and it, it looks nice. That's that's it. And everything else, you're going to have problems. Okay, moving on to the next question. Is there an acceptable population of zebra mussels for ecological perspective? Yeah, I, um, I think we kind of covered this. Yeah, I'd say, I'd yeah. say no. <laughs> yeah, okay. Moving on to the next one. Can we have a healthy lake ecosystem if the zebra mussels are controlled at some uh, present level? If so, what is the cost annually? Preset level. Yeah, if the mussels could be kept at some determined or preset level. So, um, we're, yeah, I mean, that that is kind of the, we're at the cutting edge of that. And, um, you know, as we described, I've been focused more on eradication and John introduced me somewhat to the concept, look, maybe we don't need to eradicate, let's just, you know, knock them back, keep them at a acceptable level. But that has not been practiced much. Um, we're sort of at the vanguard of, of doing that. And there are other people picking it up now, um, USGS in Wisconsin, and there's work in Minnesota, and there's growing interest in, uh, we've got projects, um, in other states as well, where um, they're taking the same approach that, gosh, we might not be able to afford an eradication. Let's see how it looks if we just, you know, do control steps to keep them off our docks and boats, just treat around the high value areas. Um, but it's a, it's a relatively new approach and, um, uh, because in the past, people just sort of threw up their hands and said, oh my God, zebra, you know, don't get zebra mussels because once you get them, you can't do anything. There's nothing you can do. Well, we've shown that, you know, there are things you can do. Yeah. Um, but as to whether that's going to be, you know, acceptable for people, um, again, it's a bit subjective. I, I, I know that we can treat around the shoreline and, you know, control, keep them off, um, and, and, you know, John showed those pictures uh, at Highland Lake. They're really kind of testing how low can we go in terms of treatment? How little can we treat and still find acceptable results? And those results that you looked at in the photos, they might be acceptable for some people and not for others. You know, some people might not want to see a single muscle on their boat um, and others are okay with 100 and maybe somebody else with a thousand. So it's it's kind of subjective. Um, and, and, and and to add to that, I mean, our, our research, we're also always looking for another, you know, what what works, what doesn't work, what and and as David pointed out, our our hope someday is that there would be some, you know, more natural process for controlling zebra mussels, but uh, uh, one of the thoughts is that by uh, uh, at least trying to do something where we're actually improving the, the utilization of the lake, uh, we're sustaining our fish populations, we're not promoting cyanobacteria growth, you know, those kind of things. But we're also giving nature a chance to, to fight these guys because they're just so prolific. And keep in mind, zebra mussels, you get down to, you know, eight to 12 feet. Um, they don't populate at that levels. Our, 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 uh, we have devices that go down to 30 feet in our lake and we're seeing zero populations from 12 feet down. So our, our treatment of along the shoreline seems to have uh, a, a pretty good effect uh, on the populations, uh, but we still need time to study it and work on it. So I'm not, I'm not, saying that you know one camp's better than the other yet because our data is still coming in um and and i'm 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 thinking that you know if you guys uh shoot for an elimination uh process uh it might actually be the better solution but if you do please include a study so you're monitoring it 
because uh, yeah, that's for sure. We want that message to come across. We haven't uh, really gotten into that at all yet, but monitoring is critical. And I know that that piece was somewhat weak uh, in the past year at Apple Canyon Lake and should certainly be corrected going forward. You need to keep very good records of how much product was applied per volume of water and you know per surface acre of area. And uh, you, you, know, you wanna measure the results because every site is a little bit different and you want data customized to your own site if you can. Um, and, and I just wanna put a little commercial in for our project. Um, we're, we're, our project is uh, in Lake County is actually state funded and we do have an obligation to share our research, our protocols, our curriculum we're developing uh, because uh, that monitoring is, uh, it can be just as expensive as treatment uh, unless you have some way to do it with inexpensive labor. Uh, and for me being a former high school science teacher, uh, I know a very effective source of inexpensive labor is uh, environmental science students. And they certainly can do this kind of research and actually eagerly seek it and enjoy doing it. So uh, if you do a, a monitoring system, I hope that you will engage your local high school, your local community college, um, and identify uh, youth in your area that would be interested in it and uh, find some champion like me in your area that can promote this uh, project uh, and um, and then you know we'll start sharing our knowledge across the whole uh, uh, environmental science universe. Yeah, I'd like to bring out that uh, we actually John uh, assisted me to talk to River Edge, and they uh, try to get a science teacher involved in this project with us, but. Uh, uh, they weren't quite interested at this particular well, time. I, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you, I'm a retired superintendent in Illinois. Um, I've done everything in education. I was actually worked for the Illinois State Board of Education. Um, uh, I can be much more persuasive and your community can be much more persuasive than uh, I would. I would strongly recommend if you go down this route, uh, it, the most powerful thing may not be your checkbook. It might be your voice. You know, get get to your school board and say, "Hey, look, we we want to involve these students because right now, uh, in the education world, there's a big movement away from career education to career education, and trying to get students engaged in a career in their life. And uh, you just have to have the right words. And I'd be more than happy to uh, work with you on that. Get those uh, get the schools involved. But your voice is very powerful." Trust me, you, you, if you if you haven't heard back from them, I certainly can get their attention. <laughs> Thank you. All right, the next question. Um, should ACL wait to add new fingerlings fish stock into uh, the lake? Um, wait till the, the shoreline treatments uh, have been applied at, or at the end of the year or wait for a couple of years. Will zebra mussels or treatments have a negative effect on them? I don't think that, I don't foresee EarthTech QZ applications having any significant impacts on fingerlings introduced to the lake. Um, you know, I told you that we use this product in drinking water and in swimming pools. What I didn't mention is that it's also used in fish hatcheries. Um, there's several state fish hatcheries that have had invasive species, either zebra mussels or others like the New Zealand mud snail, um, and there are other invasive mollusks um, that EarthTech QZ has been used for to eliminate those invasives directly in a fish hatchery where their prime concern is the health of the fish. And there's uh, a particular state hatchery in Arizona that has been using it for three years, several treatments per year they would not keep coming back to use the product again and again if it was harming the fish in any way, shape or form. In fact, there are many fish farmers, catfish farmers um, in the South who use the same product in their fish ponds um, for various purposes. But one of the uh, side effects that they noticed is that the fish are actually healthier. Why? Because 
it controls bacterial disease on their fins and gills, gill rot and fin rot. And so, um, you know, frankly, if there was a fish kill at Apple Canyon Lake or any lake that our product is used, that's our worst nightmare. You know, that's a very bad optic. We don't want to be associated with a fish kill because it makes people think that we kill fish <laughs> or that you have to kill fish in order to use the product to kill zebra mussels. And that's just not the case. We have shown in those uh, previous um, case studies that I, I shared at the beginning, we treated and eradicated zebra mussels without significant loss of fish. You might see a few couple, couple of dead fish, maybe they got caught in an area of high concentration when you're dispersing the product, you know, before the product does disperse very well on its own and, you know, soon it'll reach the same concentration everywhere. But before that happens, if there's a very high, you know, high concentration of plume essentially of the product right after application, maybe there's a couple fish that could get caught in that and you might see a few, but that's not what, um, you know, uh, we're talking about when we talk about a fish kill that a fish kill is, you know, hundreds, thousands of fish, like you sort of wipe them out um, or have a really big impact. So I wouldn't worry about, um, you know, the, the fingerlings. We, we probably wouldn't choose to treat just immediately, you know, days after um, they were introduced because fish are very susceptible to stress. And, you know, you get a few different types of stress altogether then you can have loss of fish, but, um, yeah. and, and fish would be stressed when they're first introduced. Um, so we would avoid those sorts of stresses, but um, otherwise I, I, I really wouldn't um, have any heartburn about treatment into a lake that's being stopped. Yeah, let me, and, and let me, uh, that uh, David's answer was, I see this as a two-part question. One, does Earth Tech QZ affect, you know, uh, fish? And David, I think, effectively answered that question. I think there's another question is, uh, are you just throwing fish away? Because if there's no uh, biomass uh, in the system for those fish to ingest, to eat, to grow, uh, they're going to eventually die off. And uh, the, the, the bigger question is uh, not, is Earth Tech QZ bad for the fingerlings? The bigger question is, are zebra mussels bad for the fingerlings? And are you throwing your money away when you stock a lake if you have uh, zebra mussel populations? And, and my argument is uh, that there's, there's a strong argument that removing biomass from the water column uh, will dramatically affect your uh, your fish population. So uh, I, I, I would be hesitant to put any fish into a lake that has zebra mussels just because of the competition of zebra mussels will overcome any biomass in that lake. All right, thank you. Uh, Don't worry about on. your QZ, worry about your zebra mussel. <laughs> <laughs> moving on. How many years uh, do we buy if we do a lake eradication? but a few are reintroduced, zebra mussels are reintroduced in sub subsequent years. Yeah, well, that would be, <laughs> that's sort of a worst case scenario, right? You make the decision to, you know, go all in, spend the money to do a full eradication, and then, you know, worst case, next year they're reintroduced. You certainly don't want that to happen. And you, you guys, you know, it's not going to be pleasant, but you should really start to suck it up and decide you're going to monitor more carefully the traffic in and out of the lake. Um, one good reason is just what John was describing about the difference between zebra and, and quagga mussels. You've got zebra mussels now. It's bad, but it could get worse if you got quagga mussels. So, you know, you, you want to keep them out and you also don't you, you know, it's not responsible to be sending boats out of Apple Canyon Lake into other lakes and, you know, infesting those lakes with zebra mussels. So you need to implement some program for monitoring and inspecting boats. And I can refer you to people that's outside our wheelhouse, but um, there are um, cleaning stations that you can, you know, purchase um, to help uh, remove 
you know, and decontaminate boats that are um, coming in or, or going out. But in any case, um, you know, trying to answer the question more directly, um, you know, I think you've got about five or six years between the time the muscles are introduced to when they get to the level that you're seeing now. Um, I, I don't know if you've been able to ascertain exactly when muscles were uh, first introduced to Apple Canyon Lake, but I remember hearing anecdotally, somebody said, you know, came to uh, say, I found, look, look at this muscle that I found and someone else would find, oh yeah, we've had those for years. And um, it will take, like just as John said, they first discovered them in 2018 in Highland Lake. And then two years later, they were everywhere. Well, I don't think they were introduced in 2018. I think they were probably introduced in 2015. Um, and, you know, it took until 2018 that somebody actually, you know, there were enough of them that somebody saw and, um, you know, noticed it as like an issue. So if they got reintroduced uh, or if your eradication, eradication means 100%, let's say you got 99.99% .99 removal, you would at least, I think, buy yourself about five years of relief um, from the levels of infestation that you you have um, yeah, this, now. And, and I don't know if you can see on the screen, this is our, inside here is our first one that we identified. Um, and, and my sample, I, I keep it. Uh, and, and David's right. Uh, when I, I said identified was in 2018, okay? Uh, when they were introduced, uh, we don't know that. Uh, and then there's a big argument on the lake between fishermen and boaters. Uh, the fishermen blame the boaters and the boaters blame the fishermen because uh, there's a lot of ways to introduce uh, zebra mussels to a, a, a aquatic environment. And uh, they're, they're very, very prolific, as we've already explained. So um, how long? Uh, and again, every lake is different. You know, you you have you know your streams and stuff like that. If if the introduction is down by the outflow by the dam, uh, by the spillway, it may take longer than if it's up by the inlets, and it might happen on one of the inlets and not on the other inlet areas. So, you know, you you might by the time it saturates the whole lake, it, it, David's right, it could take years. Okay, thank you. Moving on. Um... Has there been a consideration to adjust the fish stocking program to introduce zebra mussel predators? Will blue uh, catfish, uh, freshwater <coughs> drum, or red-eared sunfish a potential predator to the zebra mussels? Before uh, both of our uh, doctors uh, uh, talk about this, I would like to say that the Zebra Mussel Ad Hoc Commission discussed stocking the red-eared sunfish. We uh, did not want uh, to introduce another fish species into Apple Canyon Lake. It was our understanding uh, they would uh, have an inadequate impact on the zebra mussel population, but then I'll turn it over to the two doctors. Yeah, I would caution against putting much hope in that uh, kind of approach or uh, putting your financial resources into that. Um, any ben beneficial impacts will be a drop in the bucket um, just because of what we've talked about, the, how the mussels are so prolific. And I doubt you'd see any impact at all um, other than, you know, the occasional satisfaction of seeing, a, a, you know, oh, I saw, I saw a red ear sunfish and it ate a mussel. <laughs> but, you know, there's 49,999 mussels per square meter behind that one that it ate. And um, it's just, they're not a, um, it's a drop in the bucket. And uh, I mean, aside from the fact that history is rife with examples of, um, you know, invasive species being uh, treated with other living um, species that feed on them and then having their own unintended impacts on the ecosystem, so it's it's rarely that simple. Yeah, I, I, and I want a couple of things. One is 
uh, anytime you introduce an, another species into an ecosystem, uh, you know, you're, you're just continuing to disrupt the, the, the balance here. You, you need, really need to understand that for you introduce a higher level predator into an environment. Uh, and there's a great book called The Death of the Great Lakes by Dan Egan. Um, I, I encourage anybody to read that because it just uh, shows the fallibility of man to try to assume that you can uh, take a top down attack level. Uh, the, 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 uh, we looked at that, the, that solution for Highland Lake uh, we studied it and uh, really quickly abandoned that concept because it, it, it was just there were so many negatives and and like any ecosystem you're going to introduce a population it may survive for a while but as soon as it overcomes its food source uh, it'll die off you'll have a fish kill and and then you're back to ground zero. Okay, thank you. What if any chemical or pesticide treatments have been considered or used so far? for zebra mussels? Uh, I'm gonna assume this is uh, with respect to lake treatment as opposed to say infrastructure. You know, in infrastructure, they've used chlorine um, uh, to protect pipes. And, but in the lake um, environment, um, copper is one and EarthTech QZ is of course uh, a copper. Uh, two others that I know about are potash, and a bacteria that is naturally occurring called Pseudomonas florensis. And the commercial name for that bacteria, it is commercialized, is uh, Zequinox. And um, Zequinox was discovered by doing some, uh, they, there was a library of compounds, uh, chemical compounds, you know, they keep a, data, a, a database of compounds. And uh, they do what they call high throughput screening. They just test thousands of compounds, just randomly see if um, this naturally occurring compound might happen to control this pest or disease or whatever. And there was a hit uh, on this Pseudomonas florensis. So there's nothing about, there's no ecological relationship between uh, the bacteria that's under, you know, that makes up Zequinox and the occurrence of zebra mussels in the field. And it just was a luck, you know, by luck, this bacteria makes a compound that is toxic to the zebra mussels. Now, the issues, and so, uh, and frankly, that's pretty sexy because if you've, like I said, the holy grail is something that only kills the target pest. Well, in this case, it's not quite, that, um, although it's marketed that way, it does have impacts on other organisms as well, um, but it's primarily on zebra and quagga mussels. So it's, a ve it's very tantalizing as an um, alternative to examine. And if people want to, you know, have at it. However, I will caution you that um, they won't tell you how much it costs. And I don't even know if the company is still really in existence because um, it, it was around and popular um, five years ago because they did a lot of marketing and they went public, they did rounds of investment and they had a really good marketing machine. Um, but they wouldn't tell you how much it costs because they knew that would be the end of the conversation. <laughs> it's um, about a hundred times more expensive than um, an earth tech QZ treatment. And that's assuming you can even get the product because it has to be cultured. It's a biological um, toxin um, that has to be cultured like in vats, the same way you culture yeast to make beer. Um, and so, uh, you know, they can only make limited amounts. And um, also it's not a hundred percent effective. It's about, 70 to 90% effective. So uh, once again, interesting uh, idea. And if it you know, were economical and had a high degree of efficacy, I'd be all behind it. But because it has those limitations of being exorbitantly expensive and not 100% effective, just kind of you know, 70 to 90%, depending on the batch 
um, I just, I don't think it's viable. Um, potash is a naturally occurring, it's um, potassium chloride, but potash is like the mined version. Um, some of the issues there, are that it can have arsenic and other things because it's from the soil impurities that can um, have unintended side effects. Um, but it has been used in a, a couple of instances to successfully eradicate mussels, um, zebra mussels. It's not selective. It's basically a salt and you're making the water so salty that um, it uh, kills the zebra mussels, but it also kills other mollusks and crustaceans like crayfish and anything with a shell is susceptible to it. So it's, uh, it's not selective, it's pretty broad spectrum. And uh, on the cost piece, it's about four times the cost of um, Earth Tech QZ. Not so much because of the cost of the potash, but because of the labor of getting it into the water, you have to use very, where we use, you know, one part per million, they use a hundred parts per million. So you're making up these wow. slurries, huge batches of um, potash slurry that then needs to be put everywhere in the lake. And it's a huge endeavor to be tanker trucks. I mean, a, a lake the size of Apple Canyon Lake, you'd be looking at tanker trucks every day for weeks. Um, uh, hey, hey David. Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll give you the short answer. We looked extensively at this stuff and it was way overpriced, way too costly, way too disruptive. Uh, the, the only thing we found up to this point is either, you know, you, you, you just live with them uh, or you come up with a, a Earth Tech QZ or something that is uh, reasonable in price. Uh, and we haven't found anything uh, uh, that matches this stuff. So, uh, yeah, I think, I mean, I, 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 don't want, I don't want to linger too long on, on stuff that we know doesn't work, but the studies on this were done about 10, 15 years ago. And there, and I was reading through some of the research and, uh, some of the stuff they were trying on lakes, not just these, but others. And it was, uh, everybody was just trying to come up with something. Because we were we were all just in fear of the zebra mussels getting into the lakes, and so about 10, 15 years ago, there was a lot of. I mean, they were spending <clears throat> millions of dollars on research, and um, uh, so far, uh, the the best thing so far that we've seen is uh, Earth Tech QC. Bottom line. Okay, let's just move on to the next question. Should lakes restrict? Uh, should ACL restrict the time that boats are allowed to launch? I'm not quite sure. Uh, if this was during a, an, uh, an application treatment or an inspection process, um, I, I don't know uh, if Dr. Hammond could talk to that. Yeah, I wasn't the sure what they meant either. That's certainly not necessary for the treatment. As I said, I mean, people could be swimming in the water the same day of treatment. For practical purposes, I'd like to see the lake closed, you know, during the treatment, just so you don't have boats interfering or, you know, um, and also, as I said, when you first dispense the product, there might be plumes of the product before it gets fully dispersed um, and, and uh, diluted, you know, to its concentration. Then you'd uh, want to avoid being in, you know, a very high um, plume of concentration, but uh, as a swimmer. But as far as, um, you know, interfering, uh, there, there's no conflict there. So, um <laughs> And, and and my my answer is very short. Uh, I, I literally go swimming right after treatment. Uh, I, I I've done the research on the lethality of this. You, you uh, this is something that does not affect uh, 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 you know normal uh, life forms like humans. In fact, you need copper. <laughs> so you know it's it's just what uh, it's not the Earth Tech QZ that you're going to get sick from if you ingest lake water. Trust me. Um, it's going to be something else, uh, but it's, uh, a yeah, but, well, like anything, the, if you get yeah. too much, I mean, there is a toxic concentration. Yeah. Don't, yeah, don't, but it's, don't, it's yeah, don't, 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 you know, drink it straight, you know, I mean, but I, you know, in fact, boat limitations, uh, I, I, I don't, I mean, in fact, somewhat, um, you know, David, you might want to consider having people go out in boats and help spread the <laughs> Earth Tech UZ around the lake if it helps distribution. I don't know. 
Uh, but uh, all I can say is the answer to this one is uh, we have no restrictions on uh, around Earth Tech UZ. We do have restrictions on access to the lake. Uh, and keep in mind, we are not an association. We, we are a volunteer group. Uh, people donate their dues. Uh, they voluntarily follow the rules. Uh, we do this by education and by knowledge and by monitoring. And that's how we provide regulatory control is we get the people around the lake to see the value of these rules and then they comply. And uh, until 2018, we had done a pretty good job. I was very proud that we hadn't had zebra mussels yet uh, in our lake because we've been fighting them for probably about six or seven years. And then when we discovered the first one, uh, we've now gone to an extensive level to educate our community to the level that they fund our project uh, for the treatment. Because the state doesn't pay for our treatment. The state only pays for our, our education and monitoring uh, program, but they will not pay for the Earth Tech QZ. That comes out of our pocket. And uh, our, our efforts to date have been very successful in, in making sure that our community sees the value in it and the donations flow in. In fact, I, I know we could even get more money uh, for our program uh, if I go around the lake and ask because they've seen the results. Well, if we assume that the question was instead directed at, you know, should we restrict the time uh, boats are allowed to launch in order to prevent spread or reintroduction or those things, then I would say the short answer is yes, in my opinion. I mean, you, you want to keep a tighter uh, level of control on traffic in and out of the lake. And one way to do that would be restricting the time to, of course, that's a trade-off. It doesn't give people the freedom and liberty that they're used to. But, you know, if that's the question, I would say, yes, you, you probably should. Yeah. And you, I mean, I could see a lot of the, one of, some of the things that we're considering doing is before you like we're restricting like marinas so or who can actually launch a boat. Uh, we don't really have a boat ramp, but we have an access area. Uh, it's not public, but we can control who has gets on that property. And so we're restricting the marinas that can launch a boat in and out. Uh, we also are uh, looking at developing a database of videos where they would have to, uh, using their phone, just go around and video uh, the, the boat and how they drained it and how they cleaned it and so forth, and then submit that uh, for evidence so that if they didn't do that, because uh, there is a $25,000 fine for transporting uh, invasive species in, in, in Illinois, and we would, uh, you know, I don't know if we would win, but we, you know, uh, certainly go after somebody if they didn't follow proper procedures. Okay, thank you. Moving on, here's an ACL question. ACL treated for zebra mussels for the first time this year. Was it, was it successful? I would venture the guess that yes, it was successful. Uh, we did three areas, but it actually was expanded from that. We did the uh, Nixon Beach area, we did the jumping rock area and the marina area. Now we've selected those for particular reasons. Uh, we wanted to keep the zebra mussels away from the Nixon beach area. So kids uh, or, or swimmers using that facility wouldn't step on a, a sharp zebra mussel and possibly get cut by them. Now we saw the benefits of treating that particular area because the boats next to it were pretty well clean during the the, the summer months as well as into the fall. We saw just a few mussels attached to those. The jumping rock, we did the same on that because that is a, uh, re uh, a recreational area that all of our, our people enjoy going up to and getting up, up, up onto the rock and then jumping off of. And while we got get up onto that rock, if we had zebra mussels attached to that, we would get a lot of uh, cuts from on swimmers that were going up there. We did have a couple on that, but there wasn't very many, um, but we're trying to go for zero. Now, with that said, the treatments for that jumping rock also included um, the Washington Bay area as in Concord Bay areas that are um, on each side of the jumping rock. Those were actually uh, 
treated as well. And I think uh, the boats in those um, areas actually um, uh, saw very little zebra mussels, if none, on their shore stations and boats. We also did the Nixon Beach, or rather the marina area, because the pumps that um, uh, irrigate the golf course are located in that uh, particular zone. And we didn't want the, those pumps to get infested with the zebra mussels. So those areas, uh, we saw a definite uh, reduction of zebra mussels. So I, I say what we did was successful. Uh, we'd like to expand on, um, on using uh, particular monitoring devices, treatment monitoring devices that John, you gave us a video on how to create those monitoring devices. And yeah. we'd like to take advantage of this over the winter time to build those. If you have a comment on those monitoring devices and how you use them, go ahead and tell us. And 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 I, I, I uh, those devices work really well because what they do is they and we've got some improvements on that design. So make sure before you build it, um, I got to talk to you about using swimming noodles. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but um, one of the things that we're finding is that there the uh, the original concept, so if you read some of the research in, in uh, zebra mussels, they would actually have uh, uh, people, they would count the numbers of, uh, of, of zebra mussels on plates. I mean, literally thousands of little zebra mussels. They would have graduate students counting these things. We'll talk about a terrible job. Um, and then uh, there's a, a book on limnology by Wenzel, and he's uh, the guru of limnology. And he, he basically defined uh, what you should monitor is not the number, but the biomass. So what we've done is develop this uh, plate technology so that you can easily and cheaply uh, develop a system that can um, find out the biomass uh, over a course of a season of, of a uh, invasive species like the, the zebra mussels. And um, uh, I, I would strongly encourage you to you know, move in that direction. We're now doing that in four lakes. We're, we're expanding that now to 10 to 12 lakes next summer. Uh, very, very expensive to build them. They're under, you know, 10 bucks a piece. And um, we're coming up every year with better ways to, to implement uh, the devices without being disruptive to the, the lake. All right. Thank you. Moving on. Um, is ACL going to try and try and eradicate then put in place preventive measures to prevent future infestation for the evasive aquatic species. What is the plan to ensure that boats entering the lake have been pressure washed and the uh, of zebra mussels have been removed? Should the lake set up a wash station before the boats come down the ramp and enter the parking lot? Um, as you know, we currently have three recommendations that are sitting uh, uh, for board approval. And, and that is not an eradication, but it's a shoreline application that we thought as uh, the commission, the, the homeowners could um, tolerate uh, what it's gonna take to do the shoreline application to try to control the zebra mussels. Um, as part of that, um, we are going to want and need additional uh, collection of data so we can see what we're doing as well as use proper monitoring devices while, while we treat. Um, as far as uh, boat inspections and boat cleaning, um, this is going to be a, a big change for everybody at Apple Canyon Lake. And we all know that we're stewards of the lake. All right, and this will be probably just being discussed um, as the next part as as we go forward with with uh, addressing this next year. Okay, so uh, that's how we stand um, on that. Um, if we ch uh, choose only to treat the the shoreline, is this a long term cost um, paired to a plan to eradicate the uh, uh, in the the uh, the future of Asian species. Um, you know, Dr. Hammond has actually brought up, and and he would like us to do 
a full eradication. He's even talked about saying that this would cost probably about uh, 500 to $700,000, okay, to do a full eradication. So we thought, again, it would be a much feasible um, uh, challenge to just go ahead and do the shoreline applications to see what occurs and then start this monitoring process uh, so that we can figure out where we're going. But at this particular time, we have no plan other than the two, the, the shoreline applications. I don't, uh, Dr. Hammond or, or John, I don't know if we wanna jump in on this. I think we kind of talked about it uh, with lake monitoring devices and so on to assist us. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I guess you can do the math and calculate uh, if you do the, you know, how many yearly treatments could you do before um, it becomes more um, beneficial or more economic, economical to have done a full eradication. And, um, you know, these are kind of best guesses in any case. Um, and it, it just gives you kind of ballpark estimates. Um, but it's, uh, it's gonna be a judgment call and it, uh, certainly the eradication, the justification for the eradication is predicated on keeping them out going forward. So that's a piece of this as well. Um, and I just wanna come, you know, we're already an hour and a half in and I know we want everyone's questions to be answered um, to their satisfaction, but people are gonna get tired and um, have other things to do. So um, I know we've kind of diver diverted from some of the questions and gotten um, editorialized and all, but let, let's uh, try to crank out, you know, get through the rest here before we're, you know, too much later. Yeah, yeah well, I'd also like to, you know, so, so we're respectful of Dr. Hammond's time and stuff like that, if we could, Kind of wrap up with my my questions for for me and for Dr. Hammond. Um, you guys can talk about your. Okay. Your... With that said, I think what we'll do is we'll uh, turn this over to the next piece with Sean Cottrell. You've got those questions uh, uh, going with the tra uh, the chat area. Can you move forward with those? Uh, yep. Sure. Will. Um, so the first question that I have for uh, Dr. Hammond and Dr. Sonnenberg. Um, and this uh, goes back to the um, earlier this year, there was another town hall on zebra mussels um, where Dr. Hammond presented. Um, and Dr. Hammond, you talked about some lakes um, where there was, um, uh, where Earth Tech QZ was applied for treatment. Um, I think you spoke a little bit as far as what was the outcome of these treatments. Um, but I think there is some question as far as, um, is it possible to eradicate zebra mussels? Uh, well, um, yeah, I showed those two case studies of um, full lake eradications. So yes, now um, it depends on the size of the lake. You're never going to eradicate them from Lake Erie or Lake Minnetonka, you know, which is 15,000 acres in Minnesota or, you know, a very large lake. Apple Canyon Lake at 400 acres. Yes, I think it's uh, feasible to eradicate. Thank you. And um, uh, there was another question, but you had already addressed this. Can I answer that real quick? Yep, sorry. Okay. Uh, uh, as a scientist, okay, I was born in 56 when they said you couldn't walk on the moon. And by the time I was 15, we were. So uh, I don't, I don't know if there's, if, if impossible is actually a term we should be used. Uh, the question is, what is the feasibility and practicality of, of, of a treatment? And I think those are the bigger questions. I would not assume a po impossible because we we can do amazing things. And I would continue your research, continue your investigation. Uh, and uh, let's see what, you know, I would recommend, you know, you guys evaluate Earth Tech UZ to see what it can do, but keep, keep your mind open that someday it may be possible. Thank you. Um, and just to clarify, I know you guys hit this earlier, but I'm just gonna, I'm running down this list. Um, do you still recommend striving for total eradication? I believe you all said yes, but just um, so you have an opportunity to co uh, confirm that. Yeah, I think we've addressed that, you know. Yeah, uh, I, I think we're approaching it different ways, but yeah, I mean, I, 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 see, I see the discussion is that's, that would be the goal, but how we get there is, uh, could be different ways. Ours is a shoreline treatment until nature takes its course. 
but that may be more costly in the long run. Excellent, thank you. Um, Dr. Hammond, I think this question is a tour, uh, um, uh, for you. Um, per the Earth Tech QZ treatment protocol, control of invasive mollusks in open water, uh, maintain a dissolved copper concentration of no less than 0.1 to 0.2 milligrams per liter in the treated water for at least 10 days. Um, in our own experience, ACL has not been able to maintain these desired levels for more than several hours. I mean, I'm not sure. Um, I'm not. Uh, I'm, I'm reading this from the statement. I'm not sure if that if we've actually shown that. Um, so I guess the question is, um, how can this concentration be achieved in our lake? Okay, so this gets into the logistics and mechanics of um, treatment. And, um, you know, some of that is, I would say, our IP, um, you know, our expertise. And, um, but, um, it, you know, if you treat the whole lake, then you can get whatever concentration you want. Um, if you treat the shoreline, mm -hmm. then the product will disperse. And, um, you know, you can say, you can say, oh, I'm going to treat the, you know, the entire perimeter at a 30 foot or, you know, 50 foot uh, width um, for all the way around the shore. And you calculate that um, volume of water and you treat at, say, 0.2 milligrams per liter into that water. But if you didn't put up a curtain or some barrier of some sort, there's nothing that stops that water from mixing with the water next to it. And so it, you know, yeah, I'm not surprised if you're saying we treat it at this theoretical concentration. And then when we measured it, it didn't match the theoretical. Well, yeah, because it, you know, it got mixed with the other water. So um, yeah. that's the tricky part of a shoreline only treatment. Right. And um, the, it's the trade off. Yeah, um, and, and it's and, and be honest with you, it's it, it'd be easier for our lake than yours. Um, and the way we are handling it now, and thanks to Dr. Hammond, uh, we have a DR nine hundred, so we actually can go in and and test for the copper levels. And the way we treat is that we monitor until the copper levels drop, and then we treat again, and we uh, treat over time, not a one time treatment, to maintain our levels. So you can monitor copper levels. It's pretty cheap to monitor. Oh, copper levels. No. Yes. Um, I'm sorry. Someone sounds to be unmuted. Mom. Sorry, I had to mute my mom. Um, <laughs> oh, boy, that'd be nice. <laughs> it's nice to have power. Um, sorry about that, everybody. Um, in, uh, all right, we talked about um, can it be achieved? Um, we already talked about the definition of success. We talked about you, um, your, your recommendation is kind of the eradication approach. Um, you did just talk about uh, the um, kind of like that one pass treatment or only treating the shoreline. Um, is it effective treating all zebra mussels? So you, you just went through that. Um, you'd already spoken about, um, are you aware of other effective chemicals or means to control zebra mussel uh, populations? That's cool. Um, I'm gonna move on to the next set of questions. Um, uh, okay, so the next set of questions, I think you guys had already talked about this when you mentioned um, the cyanobacteria and the impact that zebra mussels have tied to cyanobacteria. Um, and there was a question as far as um, kill. Uh, if if uh, um, in, the May, in a May 26th email to the zebra mussel ad hoc uh, lead, um, when asked if zebra mussels kill a lake's ecosystem, Dr. Sonnenberg responded, absolutely. Um, the slide showing how they decrease the zooplankton is evidence. So I feel like we went through that. Um, if there are any further questions, um, please uh, add those clarifications um, into the chat, um, whoever submitted that question. Yeah. And um, by the way, we def we've never seen a fish kill. Uh, it, it is where they have a decreased population. They just die and <laughs> drift away. We haven't seen like, a, a as you do when you see a, uh, a true fish kill from cyanobacteria or something like that. Um, I'm going to yeah, pause that, for, oh, sorry, that, Go ahead, Dr. We just seen I a deep question was really um, about semantics, you know, to say that something kills a lake. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I think he's, he's trying to say, what do you mean by that? Well, 
yeah, it's probably not the best word choice. You know, um, you don't kill a lake. It's, uh, you know, well, you kill yeah. things in the lake or whatever. I think it's more um, to the point is that these zebra mussels, they don't kill the lake, but they fundamentally alter the ecosystem and take it over. That's yeah. the, the only way to kill your lake is to remove the dam. I don't think you're going to do that. So, excellent. Thank you. Um, that, and this is you talk to Devlin Lake. They'll they'll explain what a dead lake is because they lost their dam a few years ago. Oh yeah, I remember seeing that in the news. Um, of the many bodies, and this might be to both of you, but it was originally directed to Dr. Sonnenberg. Um, of the many bodies of water in the U.S. infested with zebra mussels, do you have a sense of how many have been treated for total eradication, partial treatment, or no treatment? Um, and that might also be uh, towards Dr. Hammond. So just um, knowing that uh, I think it was already mentioned on today's call um, about 40 years ago was about when zebra mussels started becoming this big issue, um, knowing that some of these treatments are relatively new. Um, is, there, uh, is there evidence to show, um, I mean, Dr. Hammond already did go through some slides as far as successful uh, treatments at the beginning of today's um, a presentation, yeah. so it's not let, sure. Let me jump in real quick. In all my research and all the efforts of my interns and stuff like that to identify uh, an, an eradication methodology, uh, the best one we have seen so far is things like Valley Low uh, and, and their, their recent programs. Uh, everything else has been uh, uh, mm -hmm. kind of either overly aggressive or underly successful. Yeah, this is a fairly new approach in the past. People, as I said, they, you know, don't get zebra mussels because if you do, there's nothing you can do. And they sort of threw up their hands, say, you know, throw in the towel. Um, if you get them, there's nothing you can do. And it's only been, I, you know, in answer to the question directly, I would say there's probably less than 50 lakes that have ever been treated um, to control or eradicate or, you know, um, uh, at some level deal with the zebra mussels. Um, it's a fairly new um, approach. Um, now, there are different uh, categories of treatment, uh, one of which is called a rapid response. And that has been very popular in Minnesota a rapid response is as soon as you detect that they're present, you go quickly with meaning within a couple of weeks or you know, at the outside of a couple of months and try to knock them out in, their, in the limited areas where you know they are before they spread to the lake. That's called a rapid response. And there's been quite a bit of effort in that category. And what I would say, and Earth Tech QZ has um, been used in that way um, in, in quite a few, and I would say growing number, it's become more and more the agent of choice. Um, and the outcome of those rapid responses has been generally that yes, it was effective where it was applied. However, there are many instances where the treatment area was not large enough. People didn't realize that there were also mussels in this other area and right. you know, they were subsequently discovered outside the treatment area. And so the project may be considered, oh, a failure because the rapid response did not keep mussels from colonizing that lake, but it wasn't because the product failed. The product worked where it was applied. It was a failure in the um, execution uh, and, and you know, monitoring or um, sampling to know where it was. But to my knowledge, Earth Tech QZ has been effective in every instance that it has been used to control, kill the zebra mussels where it was applied. Thank you. Um, there are some other questions um, that were uh, targeted to, or were um, for Dr. Sonnenberg, but I think you already addressed these as far as Highland Lakes approach. You talked about uh, some of the background when you're sharing your screen and kind of showing the map. Um, you already talked about um, Highland Lakes outcome. Um, and you talked about the evolution of the approach at Highland Lake. So that hits um, these questions. Um, I'm going to shift right now uh, to the questions that are in the chat that have uh, come through during um, today's uh, session. So the first question in the, the chat list is, 
Um, is there any experience with this compound? So I'm assuming Earth Tech QZ in a lake of our size. Um, the Apple Canyon Lake is about 450 acres with a significant turnover of water due to the dam and due to the tributaries uh, constantly uh, feeding into the lake. Um, so uh, just is there any experience with a similar type of lake with that with the dynamics, um, with the uniqueness of ACL? Like, is there someone, is there a lake um, that maybe we would be able to compare ourselves to? that has already well, been treated, sorry. Yeah, uh, last year, uh, well, th this year, I guess, th this last summer, uh, 2022, uh, uh, EarthTech QZ was used to treat um, part of Lake Minnetonka, a, a bay that was, um, I think it's 320 acres. And um, it's a bay that is fairly, isolated from the rest of the lake because it's it's got a narrow very narrow opening so for um uh it's kind of like a separate lake but you know similar to what you just described for apple canyon most lakes have some in influent and some effluent you know it's flowing in somewhere and flowing out somewhere um and so uh that I believe is the largest one so far we've progressed uh stepwise you know we started with small one, small projects that were um, several acres. And then uh, the two cases that I um, shared with you today um, at the beginning were both 30 acres, one being 30 acres and shallow, just like 15 feet, but the other one was 30 acres and over a hundred feet deep. And that was, you know, a big deal because, uh, you know, hundred feet is much deeper than Apple Canyon. Um, I think that we have shown that we can do it in a very wide variety of um, situations. And there's nothing uh, different about Apple Canyon than any other, uh, of, you know, than the other lakes we've treated. Yes, 400 is a little bigger than 320, um, but uh, you know, there's there's nothing materially different about it. We had another lead uh, on a 900 acre lake and they decided um, that they weren't gonna treat it this year. We may treat it next year. Um, and then there's another, uh, that's in Texas. And there's a lake that we treated this year in New York that um, is uh, about 300 acres. And they're sort of like where you guys are at they were considering eradication. They decided instead to start with shoreline treatments. Um, and they're very happy with those. Uh, you know, they got excellent control in the places they treated. So um, yeah, I don't, uh, you know, whether it's 400 exactly, um, you know, I, I, don't, I can't think of one that is 400, um, but we've got 300, 320. And uh, as I said, this 900 acre one we're prepared to do, but haven't quite done yet. Yeah, and 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 just to uh, clarify, like Lake Minnetonka, uh, again, that's a collection of uh, a number of lakes and bays. I think there's 37 lakes and bays that make up Lake Minnetonka, and they were they're similar kettle lakes to to our lake, as opposed to anthrogenetic lake that that you guys have, which is created by a dam. Um, and it, you know, it's one of those things where uh, can you treat a large body of water? Uh, I, yeah, I, I, I truly believe that you could treat a, a larger body of water. Uh, the, the question is you have to have continual treatment of the inlet areas, and that includes any, any way water can flow into the lake. So it's not the ones you see on the map, it's the ones you don't see on the map, the underground pipes and, you know, feeder lines and so forth that come from farm fields and any other place. So, uh, you know, you'd have to really do a good job designing uh, the post-treatment uh, continued uh, process, or you just wait until you see them again and then you do another whole lake treatment. And uh, and I think, you know, that that would be something else you guys can, you know, chew on for a while. So, David, do you have any discussions on that? Treat How would you treat the incoming water? Well, um, it depends whether there's mussels in that incoming water or not. I, I mean, we treat into flowing water all the time because we treat pipelines. Right. Um, if Apple Canyon um, has in, you know, uh, water flowing in 
from other places, you know, from streams, say, that would dilute the product that we, you know, just put in. And that could create a bit of a challenge right around the mouth um, where that stream is entering the lake. You know, how do you maintain a, a high enough concept, a toxic concentration when it's constantly being diluted by the influent? I mean, it's just a mass balance kind of calculation. Uh, I'm not concerned about it, but I, I can see why, you know, here's another reason why eradication would be nice. You know, just <laughs> not have to deal with these nuances um, because I, I can see if you, you know, depending on where it is and how important that area is, if, you know, how do you maintain a, a, a high concentration when it's constantly being diluted? That's going to be a challenge for that particular area. And we'll have to noodle over that. And, uh, it, you know, it's hard to speak about it in generalities because it comes down to the specifics. Um, I mean, we could treat the flowing water as well as it's coming in. And that would be one, you know, might be on the table um, as an alternative. But, you know, the devil's in the details. We just have to look at those things and, um, you know, uh, use our experience from the many different environments. We, I mean, we've treated in fish hatcheries that have water constantly flowing through. Um, you know, we've dealt with lots of different situations. We would just need to look carefully at what's yours. Thank you. I'm a little bit of a different question, I'm more about the zebra mussels. How many times do zebra mussels spawn per year and is that impacted by region and climate? Yes, it is. In colder climates, they generally um, go through two large spawning cycles, you know, maybe in June and then again in August or September. Uh, whereas in warmer climates, like in Arizona, I've read that they, um, they uh, measured 13 spawning cycles in a single year. Um, so uh, the mussels don't tend to reproduce when the temperature drops below 50 degrees Fahrenheit. And so, um, yeah. now those are peaks, right? It's not to say that there's gonna be zero villagers outside those peaks. Uh, you know, you could check in the middle of July that is between the June peak and the August peak. And it's not to say there's zero, um, but you know, it's just relative numbers. Yeah, and, and keep in mind, the, the, the peaks are due to uh, hormonal release. Once one of them uh, releases a hormone, they all release and get happy. And, um, and so I, 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 um, the, the number of times is uh, kind of not as important as uh, can you monitor when they do it? Because one of, the, one of the key factors we're finding is the, the best time to treat uh, is when they do propagate uh, to attack the villagers, because the villagers seem to be uh, even more sensitive to Earth Tech QZ than the, the adult population. And uh, as we saw, uh, not this year, but the prior year, uh, our, our villager count went almost down to zero after we, we uh, properly treated with Earth Tech UZ. And uh, because the babies weren't there, we didn't get the adults in the fall. So that's something to keep in mind too, is, is to monitor that reproduction cycle. And to do that, use a zooplankton net and you have, uh, in fact, our, our interns are trained on how to use a um, uh, polarized lens uh, uh, microscope and uh, segment rafter count slides. And they uh, actually do counts of uh, villagers uh, in, this, in the water column. And we monitor that uh, consistently every two or three days uh, during the summer. So it's, it's another part of the project besides those devices that you monitor with a, a, a plankton toes. Thank you. Um, along those same lines, I'm looking at the next question in chat. Um, you have, uh, both of you have clarified that it is possible to eradicate zebra mussels. Um, uh, Sonia Bay or Co. Yeah, I, I think it's, I, 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 I qualify my statement as, I believe all science is, I, I think everything's possible as a scientist. 
<laughs> uh, how practical it is. That's that's up. That's what you guys are debating. Yeah. Um, and so I think along those same lines, um, the question currently reads, um, a question becomes, what will our lake look like when zebra mussels plateau and when will that happen? I'm assuming this would be if there were no treatments or any other measures taken um, by uh, Apple Canyon Lake. So just wondering if, if um, it, can you guys tell us what it would look like? I know um, in a previous or in that previous town hall, Dr. Hammond, you showed that um, kind of like life cycle curve um, where eventually there's kind of like a plateau. I think you mentioned it might've been like the stasis point or um, whatever that term was. But um, what, when, when a lake reaches that point, what, what does it look like? Like um, we, we talked a little bit about the health of the lake if we leave these things unchecked. Um, mm -hmm. Does that, is that kind of the same question or is this a little bit different? Well, I, I feel like we, yeah. we addressed this question, you know, fairly early on. Um, you know, uh, I described that an invasive species does go through boom and bust cycles as it's reaching the carrying capacity is the term for the, the site um, for that particular environment, how much food is available, the food that's available, what population can it sustain and it kind of overshoots and then they have a die off and it, it goes through these boom and bust cycles and once again, this person's asking us to predict the future. So, you know, there's all kinds of things that could happen in the future, um, but we can look at these trends and know what's common. Uh, and, you know, we can predict that uh, you are gonna, it, things are gonna get a lot worse before they get better. Yeah. And um, uh, any plateau situation is probably gonna be worse than what you've seen so far, and um, you know what I talked about um, back where they're native, you know they're not such a big problem. Um, you know that kind of situation is probably hundreds of years from now um, in the U.S. Yeah, I, I think I, you know, and and your question is one of these. Well, it depends on your perspective. If you're just looking out over the lake on any given day, it's going to look the same. It's going to be a body of water. Um, but there may be days where there's, you know, a lot more dead fish or no fish. Uh, and, you know, it's one of these things where you look at the lake and the health of the lake underneath the lake, look at the, uh, the, the biomass and, and where that is at. And is it in the game fish or is it in, uh, uh, you know, filter feeders on the bottom, uh, zebra mussels and, um, I think I think you're going to be in a situation where it will affect the recreational use of your lake uh, for swimming, boating, uh, for fishing. Uh, you'll you'll start seeing concerns over that, and um, it it basically is a uh, uh, you get clarity of water. I mean, you can go out there uh, uh, where normally you'll see you know secchi readings of four or five feet in a, a normal kettle lake. In our lakes, uh, it, uh, when we didn't have treatments, we would see 12, 15 feet secchi readings. Nice clear water, but that means it's basically a bathtub. So if you like a bathtub, uh, you know, just let the zebra mussels do their thing. Thank you. Oh, but don't touch the edge of the tub. That's my only warning. And in, in these boom and bust cycles, you guys are still not at the first boom. I, I mean, I, I, just to yeah. make that clear, like, if this person or other, if people are thinking like it's going to get better at some point, it's not going to be as bad as it once was. You are still at the beginning of the curve up and um, any bust cycle is probably going to be worse than what you've seen yet. And, and bust is probably a good term because it's probably not good. Thank you. Um, I know you both already spoke to um, treating the uh, tributaries, um, so I'm, I won't spend time on that question. Um, and then is it, um, there's a question as far as, is it likely where, it's asking where is the infestation coming from? Is it likely that the infestation is coming from those tributaries or is it potentially coming from boats? Um, I know we've heard anecdotally, you know, like it could be aliens or like random things introducing them into the lake. Um, is there a way or what is the best way to determine um, or is it even worth determining um, where zebra how zebra mussels are coming into the lake? 
Oh, it's possible that they were only introduced by one boat and they were no longer, you know, coming into the lakes, uh, so to speak. Um, it, it, it can start with two, not one. Sometimes you know, oh, it only takes one. Well, no, it takes two, a male and a female. But um, it's possible that there was just one introduction uh, from a single boat or fisherman or somebody who who brought in, um, you know, just a couple, and then everything transpired from there. I don't think that, um, you know, the implication is that they're somehow flowing into the lake right now. I don't think that's the case. I don't think they're in um, the streams flowing into Apple Canyon Lake. They could be, they could have been introduced by numerous people, um, you know, different uh, uh, sources, different boats, um, but th that's pretty hard to determine. Um, there is a guy who does research on that. It's uh, using genomics. So looking at the genes of the different um, muscles and then seeing how closely they're related. And what he found was that most large lakes are the result of numerous infestations, not just uh, or numerous introductions rather, uh, not just a single one. Um, yeah. And on a lake your size, your size, I would guess that probably mussels have been introduced more than once, um, but not that they're currently flowing in. Yeah, I mean, uh, except yeah, in the I, sense of the flow of traffic from boats. Yeah, David, don't you think? I mean, the answer to that question is is yes. You know, they they came in from boats, from fishermen dumping their 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 bait buckets. They the you know, I've heard geese fly them in. Uh, my, one guy thought maybe Sputnik dropped them off, but um, you know, it's you know, whatever way they got there, it doesn't matter. They're there, and the important thing is, if you go for eradication, again, you're back to trying to the best you can do to keep them out of your lake, and you're going to have to go after not one thing, but you have to go after every way they can come into your lake. Yeah, I don't put a lot of credence in the the. Uh, geese or you know birds bringing them in um i don't i don't put credence david i don't put credence into any of these i just love watching the debates because they just they're really one of those kind of useless discussions it's like you know yeah uh, but i'm just addressing the it green I, packers and the bears i mean <laughs> i'm just addressing it you're not the only person to to say that there and i i think no. that there's not a lot of um support for that theory I yeah. think that um, the, and also somebody might say, why bother to eradicate if a goose is just gonna bring them in next year? That's not likely. It's, yeah. you know, you if you did eradicate, you could uh, implement a program that would um, keep them out by monitoring the boats and the um, other watercraft allowed to come into the lake. That's yeah. where it's coming from. Is, yep. you know, be as aggressive you can at any access point you can. That's my answer. Okay, let's move on, Sean. Yep. Um, so that that wraps up all of the questions that have been submitted to chat um, that I had um, okay. available to ask. So I'll turn now, it back over to you. I've got to I've got to drop off, guys. Okay, um, go ahead. Wait, 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 just a minute. Just there a minute. Last minute uh, question for me. Just a minute. Okay, so. Now I'm opening up the, the, the conversation to the people that are in the town hall meeting themselves. There should be a mic available so you can speak. Go ahead, Steve. Okay. So, is this on? Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, so, as Sean is fond of saying, in the interest of transparency, uh, I do have some questions for Dr. Sonnenberg that were kind of glanced over when Sean read them. And I'm the one that brought up uh, where Dr. Sonnenberg, you mentioned the word kill a lake. And as a scientist and as an expert in the field, words really matter. So when you say a lake is killed and the uneducated people with zebra mussels hear that, they go, our lake is going to die. And when you say, if you don't do anything, you're just going to end up with a bathtub. So those are very, very harsh words. And what, what I would like to know is zebra mussels have been in lakes for years now, decades. 
And uh, Dr. Hammond mentioned that some lakes are now treating them. They've been starting to treat them over the last whatever five to 10 years. So of all those lakes out there, hundreds or thousands of lakes in the United States and Michigan and Minnesota and Indiana, Illinois, are they dead? Well, I, um, I have not seen research anywhere when I searched. That as, 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 as I as I mentioned the book, the the you know death of the uh, Great Lakes uh, by Egan. I I think um, you know as I said, the only way to really kill the lake would be to dismantle the dam. It's my my quote. Um, your kill is a I agree with you is a relative term. It's uh, the the you know the, the your your uh the lake will still be there okay it'll be there in some format the question is it will be in the format that uh the community wants to have it and i think that's a discussion that's for you guys to de de determine right. what what you want in your lake if you want a uh kind of a monoculture environment like you're you're seeing now in the great lakes where quantum mussels now replace zebra mussels uh, and there's no other mollusk populations, and you start seeing the efforts to uh, repopulate the, the lakes with different fishes. And again, read that book. I think you'll, you'll be enlightened by it. Um, and then you start seeing how that works on a microcosmic level in, in, a, in a lake such as yours. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of things we don't know, but one of the things we do know is uh, we've seen how aggressive these, this species is. And you do need to address that, either to give up and uh, not have the, the, the same ecosystem you had, or to do something about it. So, and I, all I can say is, all, I, all I'm asking is continue the research, make sure you're part of the study. Right, and, and, you, know. and you have been involved with a lot of research. So what research have you found through universities or, or public companies or private companies yeah. that show lakes that their fish populations have crashed, their fisheries have been destroyed, uh, that kind of thing. And that's really what interests a lot of people here. Yeah. And I haven't found that. I haven't found that data. Yeah, and and, and, that. yeah. It, 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 check with the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. They, they have uh, done some extensive studies. Uh, the USGS has done some extensive studies and then look at the population fluctuations in the Great Lakes and see, see how how invasive species have affected that environment. Um, as far as what it's going to do in your lake, again, every lake is going to be different, Steve. Your your oh. lake is going to be different. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I respect your I respect your point of view. I really do, because I think it adds to that theory of science. We just have to figure out what is the best solution for your community and if 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 dr hammond and myself can be of assistance great and if not uh you know all i ask is be be part of the knowledge base in the future so other other lake communities can value that no, i i agree with that and i appreciate that but uh the the bathtub comment really really troubles me because i haven't i've talked to keegan lund and others in minnesota dnr and I'm not aware of any lakes in Minnesota being a bathtub at this point, but I could be wrong. Oh, so uh, that's all I have. Well, I can, uh, I can refer you to um, someone, I, I was just trying to see if I could pull up his name quickly and I, I couldn't, but he's with the Great Lakes Fisheries Research uh, Collaborative, or I, I forget the name, but um, he had done a lot of research on the impacts on the Great Lakes of zebra mussels. And um, there are people out there who will say, you know, to your point, um, don't be so sure that, you know, zebra mussels will harm the fish population. Uh, you know, you, you can't prove that. Uh, there may be some fish that are actually um, benefited by zebra mussel, you know, or, or they challenge the contention that these uh, zebra mussels are, you know, damaging to say the fish population. And um, this guy was, you know, th th it's his job. He was um, very um, uh, convinced and had a lot of ammunition of studies 
saying, oh, absolutely, you know, they have had a really negative impact on the fisheries within the Great Lakes. <laughs> And so I, I will try to dig up that, those references and pass them along. Um, and, you know, I think, you I, have, I think you have passed them. I thought you had passed those along to us. Maybe or, I did. Yeah, but did. yeah, it, if I did, it was along, it was like a year ago or something. So uh, I may have done that and, and forgotten. But in any case, you know, I, I also respect, you know, do we really have to do this? Is the sky really falling? Is it really going to be that bad? We're telling you, yeah, it's going to be bad. It's going to get worse before it gets better. And I stand by that comment. However, you know, you may find that, you know, it's not so bad that it requires us to spend this amount of money or, or what have you. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, I guess I would say back, and, and I agree with you. I don't think John should have used the term or phrase that, it kills the lake. That's not a concept. I, didn't, I, didn't, I, I want to correct that. I did not say it. Oh, kills John, the, okay. Don't, it didn't just kill the lake. I said it, it remove the dam. It. Remove the it. dam, it'll kill the lake. That's the only way. Well, you had the it right. Be there. Okay. Anyway. Don't miss um, your, I, I, don't, point, Steve, I guess I, I would. <laughs> okay. But the point I would say, say back to Steve is, you know, what are you trying to say? You know, I, uh, what what's your point is your point that they're not that bad or that we really don't have to do anything or you know where are you no, coming my, yeah my point's not that my point is opinions don't really matter it's what the research shows right. that, that's my whole opinion by scientific they're they definitely disrupt our ecosystem no question the question is if we don't do anything what will happen to our lake and that's we just don't know at this point and uh, I haven't seen research yet, you know, on a lake like our size that is, you know, is a bathtub or, is, you know, I, I use the word diet again, but it still, it still exists. Fisheries may have changed a bit, perhaps. Maybe it's taking longer for fish to grow to their regular size they did pre-zebra mussels. But I don't know. It's, it has also to do with research. But yeah. what, I, what I really try to avoid is, you know, hysteria around zebra mussels or anything and you know let the facts and the research show what they are i we have a problem and that will be up to the board to decide what we're going to do about it but i just want to make sure we just state facts that's all yeah and I, I i fully agree with that and if you misunderstood me i you know bathtub and and killed lake are two terminologies that i don't agree with uh, uh to kill the lake you would have to remove your dam uh, a bathtub is uh, where literally everything would be dead in the lake, and and so I I think that you're you're looking at a situation where um, to to what degree your ecosystem will be native and and meet your, your residential and and uh, ecological needs, and I think that's the balance you're trying to achieve now that you have zebra mussels. I agree with that 100. percent Okay, thank you. Does anybody else want to ask a question? Uh, nobody else is coming forth. Okay, so I, 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 uh, I, do, I do have to leave, guys. Uh, yeah, go ahead. I appreciate and, and, you. And I, I want to repeat, I'm just a volunteer. I, I don't make a penny off of any of this. I do this because I... Uh, I'm a retired educator, and I care about uh, creating the future uh, um, army or navy or coast guard of zebra mussels out there. And uh, anything I can do to help you guys, uh, whether you treat, don't treat, you know, whatever you guys do, uh, you know, please uh, let me know how I can help. Uh, thank you. We appreciate your time today. Um, with that, uh, have a good day. All right. Talk to you guys. Thank you, Dr. Hammond. I do have a couple other questions here, but they are basically ACL related. If you want to drop off, go ahead. And I appreciate your time and effort. Okay, great. Uh, thanks everyone for your attention. Uh, we covered a lot of good ground and uh, just let me know if you have any other questions or comments going forward. Otherwise, Thank you. Uh, look forward to working together. All right. Thank you, Bye. appreciate it. Bye. With that said, I, I have a couple of questions here that are more ACL related, and I'm not sure I can even answer this or if anybody can answer this. What, what costs would be involved in monitoring incoming boats to ensure they 
uh, don't have, don't bring zebra mussels into the lake. And I don't have a cost. Um, but that was brought up by uh, Dr. Sonnenberg, a very interesting piece. They actually do a self monitoring um, uh, a procedure where the boat owner actually videos the, the boat, their trailer and so on before going in, which I would assume any live wells and so on. Uh, with Clean Dray Dry uh, uh, on all states around the United States, I think all of us need to take that into consideration, but it's something that needs to be looked at. Any, anybody have a comment on that? I don't see anything. Okay, so we'll move on. Um, as stated above, more work needs on monitoring and inspection of boat entries needs to be performed. Is this work uh, in the next phase of the commission? Uh, that's probably going to probably be one of the next phases, or will it be a, a policy change uh, that has to occur? But something uh, I think needs to be done. Um, I think we need to move forward with, with the recommendations from the ad hoc commission as was pre uh, presented to uh, the board. Um, with that said, that was my last comment. Uh, does anybody else want to state anything? Yeah, um, this is Rich Crisula. I think trying to get people to self-monitor themselves, you know, to to clean their boats and make sure that they're not they're emptying their bait wells and everything like that, cleaning out the um, any water that's on board. I, I just don't think that's going to be practical. Uh, I mean, that's the reason that we're in the situation that we are now. Um, I think if we really want to eradicate uh, the zebra mussels from the lake. We're going to have to, you know, uh, bite the bullet and go and, and, and do that. But I think we would have to have a moratorium possibly for a period of a year or two uh, in which boats cannot be coming in and out of the lake, going to other lakes, uh, until we come up with some good rules or good procedure that we can control that better. Any other comments? Okay, then I think uh, we can probably thank everybody for attending today. Um, you know, it was good to hear from Dr. Hammond, Dr. Sonnenberg. Um, I thank the board, all the participants. Jen, thank you very much for, for hosting the town hall. I'm hoping that all the questions were answered as we move forward in this. And if there are any questions, that we try to get answers to them now as, as we move into the next year. All right, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I guess that's it for the meeting. Thank you for attending. Thanks Al. Thanks Al. Thanks all, bye. I just wish that was a long car. Yeah.